Getting back to the uh, seminar, the second session is uh, on the topic fraud reporting with uh, uh, focus on audit evidence and audit documentation and what are the related challenges. To share his uh, knowledge on this session, in this session we have with us uh, a senior speaker with us, uh, CA Sham Ramadhyani. May I request uh, CA Pranesh Shetty to kindly welcome the speaker onto the stage and also welcome him uh, with a bouquet of flowers. Sham, my dear friends, is a senior partner of uh, PK Ramadhyani and Co LLP, which is a firm that has about 75 years of professional standing. And he has handled a multitude of audits, listed, unlisted, banks and insurance companies. He has also rendered consultancy services in the area of taxation, including cross-border transactions. He is also a co-opted member of the Expert Advisory Committee, as well as a co-opted member of the Auditing Practices Committee. He has presented previously several papers in regional and national seminars, as well as authored articles in the Institute's journal. With this uh, very brief and small intro, I hand over the session to the speaker. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Bunch of uh, lunch at uh, 12 p.m. Uh, first of all, let me th thank uh, Shravan for inviting me to be present here to share a few thoughts with all of you. Uh, these are the topics. Here, these are the standards given to me. The auditor's responsibility to consider fraud and error in an audit of financial statements, audit evidence, audit documentation, audit sampling. Auditing of accounting estimates, including fair value accounting estimates and related disclosures, using the work of another auditor, relying upon the work of an internal auditor, using the work of an expert. These are the various standards that I've been brief, briefly asked to, uh, to deal with. Uh, in addition to this, uh, while, while, while we can go through what the standards talk about, uh, particularly fraud and error, I was just thinking, saying that maybe we can uh, we can discuss a lot and see what we can really do and how to how to ensure that yes. We give ourselves a reasonable chance to ensure that there are no fraud or serious misstatements in our financial statements. And I, I request Sundaresh to be here so that he could also share his uh, uh, thoughts with all of us rather than trying to go through the, the standard uh, line by line. Uh, I'm sure it will become very dull and boring. I will leave my presentation with all of you and then um, uh, with the branches and you can read them. They're fairly, they're fairly theoretical. Uh, it's one, the challenge comes, you will understand them easily. There won't be any difficulty in understanding. The question is how to apply it to a situation and how to make the best out of it. Uh, let us look at what is happening in the environment. Let us first of all look at public sector banks because many of you will be probably be doing uh, branch audits of public sector banks uh, shortly in the next couple of months. There is galloping increase in non-performing advances. There is uh, reported large divergences between NPAs as identified by bank management and done acceptable by the auditors and done assessed by RBI. Um, Many, by even the endings of banks have been changed, even private sector banks have been changed because there have been uh, divergences saying that there are doubts in the corporate governance process in these banks. Uh, huge reported for frauds perpetrated by borrowers and collusion with bank officials. Ostensibly, the world believes that this is not reported upon by the bank statute auditors. There has been questioning of senior bank management and statute auditors by the CBI and SFIO. We take the case of uh, now coming on to ILFS, we have a sudden default in loans by ILFS and collapse of operations. The board of ILFS has been superseded and, new, and, a, and a new board has been appointed by the government. NFRA has appointed, uh, NAFRA has, uh, has authorized reopening of financial statement for the last five years. There are questions regarding the robustness of the audit process carried out. I am not saying there is any deficiency, I am just saying there have been questions raised. There is a crisis of confidence in the audit profession and the efficacy of the regulatory oversight of ICI or its members. The government has vested the disciplinary oversight of auditors and listed and large unlisted entities in, in NAFRA. There are doubts of the abilities of banks to, uh, to be given depositors dues 
in spite of large recapitalization of taxpayers' monies, uh, because the NPAs have really carried so much <coughs> that to me, today there is always a doubt whether the bank would make profits, whether the bank is in a position to meet its uh, liabilities to its depositors. It's come to that question in a very short time. Really, I mean, what, what normally happens in 100 years probably, things have changed in the last five years so much to this, for this profession because so many I mean, charismatic changes have taken place in the environment. I mean, many times also due to technology which uh, Sundresh uh, referred to, artificial intelligence, and the lack of an audit trail in simple terms. Um, many of these things are posing great challenges for the auditor. We have, uh, we have two sets of, almost three sets of st standards today. We have uh, the accounting standards, we have INDAYAS, then we have ICDS. We have got multiple kind of kinds of standards with which we need to cope up with. We have a new Companies Act 2013. Thousands of amendments, I mean hundreds of amendments have been made in this Companies Act. Um, even after the new act was introduced in 1913, a number of circulars, uh, circulars and all have been issued. Keeping track of these things is, uh, is extremely tough. We have a new GST law which is coming. Every day changes are being made. I mean, GST is a great piece of legislation, I have no doubt about it. But every day changes are being made in this law. We don't know what laws are applicable at what point of time. The income tax law you take, every year in the Finance Act there are at least 50 changes in the Act in every Finance Act. And another 50 changes perhaps in the rules during the year. And both the GST law and the, and the Income Tax Act affect your financial statements critically. I'm not getting into other laws like Provident Fund, DSI, where uh, changes are fewer and two, probably these don't, these things don't affect the financial statement so significantly. And we have, uh, so the question is, uh, what has led to the sharp divergence in the quantum of NPS income and provisioning? Could these frauds, business failures be pointed out to the statute auditors? And what are the causes for this? Is it lax auditing procedures? Did the auditors, particularly in banks, restrict themselves only to review of assets and liabilities at the end of the year? No tests of uh, control and substantive procedures are carried out. Audit procedures are not taken seriously by management. Or is it just particularly bank audits or a slam bank audits where you just do for three days, collect your check and go home? What is the cost for whatever that's happened so far? I mean, I'm sure as a profession we need to introspect. And I'm sure um, may, maybe the public perception is different, but uh, probably they feel that we should do everything. But then at least I'm sure that we have faulted somewhere. The truth probably lies somewhere in between. I think there's a huge wake up call for the profession. Uh, and what do we need to remedy the situation? Uh, can the profession emerge stronger out of the present crisis or will it sink in its importance due to its inability to read the situation and respond satisfactorily in this, in this hour of crisis? The responsibility lies with each one of us. And uh, the single biggest uh, factor which seems to be weighing in the mind of the government is that the auditors are not doing sufficiently about frauds. And as all of us know, frauds could be a two times, two times it could be financial embezzlement, or two, they could be material misstatements in the financial statements. It could be both. Nothing, uh, nobody might embezzle money, but again, the financial statements not, uh, may not reflect a true and fair view. Both these are considered to be frauds. So the question is, how do we, I mean, this is perhaps the single biggest uh, sore point between, let's say, the profession and the, the government and the regulator, saying that we are not doing enough, or uh, we have not been able to, as a, as a collective <coughs> body, we have not been doing enough to um, identify frauds. Frauds are happening everywhere. Uh, let's just take an example. If, let's say, the whatever happened in Granny Street, Punjab National Bank, happened in one of the audits that all of us are going to do in the next couple of months. Particularly on some off-balance sheet item like letters of credit. <coughs> I think we would, most of us would be a sitting duck because particularly as far as off-balance sheet items are concerned, I don't think most auditors do anything. Perhaps they would just match the figure with the general engine. And that's the end of it. Or at the most you might have checked a few transactions, I mean, you might have ticked a few entries with the entries in the core banking solution. Maybe cause checked a couple of uh, payment of fees along with it, but then you would have hardly probably any documentation, particularly of of, of balance sheet items. And given the fact that most bank audits are done within let's say a span of maximum five days, five working days. Okay, all of us. If tomorrow there is a, there's something like Brandy Street happens there, 
I think, uh, God forbid, uh, all of us would be hold over the call because we would have no documentation at all on this. Because most of the time in bank audits, the proprietor or the partner goes along with the staff. They sit through two days and in this two days you have got tons of things to be done. You have to check uh, provisioning, you have to read the inspection reports, you have to give a couple of certificates, you have to do tax audit, you have to do Goshen Jilani. Uh, so what is the real time, effective time that you have to do an audit itself? Apart from reporting and stuff with that, checking all copies, you are signing multiple <coughs> copies. So apart from checking all this, what is the effective time all of us spend on an audit? 8 hours, 10 hours, 20 hours into let's say 2, 3 people max I think even 60 hours, 70 hours would be a, would be being optimistic and in the 70 hours what importance do you attach for off balance sheet items or tomorrow let's say there's a big fraud in DDs and TTs or in interbranch reconciliation or in, in whatever it is what is the chance that we are giving ourselves that we will find this out I think this is a wake up call for the profession we can't continue uh, Sometimes the way we have possibly done. I think there is a the real truth. Mumbai, the government might be blaming us for everything that's happening in the world, but I think the truth somewhere lies in between. And I think it's important that we do stand up and at least definitely do what is expected from us, and then see where uh, where it can take us. I'll uh, briefly take you through the fraud standard, and then I will uh, stop at that. I will not get into all the other. Uh, I'll come back to the rest of the standards if I have time at the end. Let us just discuss things in a simple manner what we can all do um, um, to ensure that yes, if you follow all the steps which Sundaresh has told you, I am sure uh, you will give yourself a damn good chance that uh, fraud will get detected and detected. But then nevertheless, let us uh, just go through in some areas what we can possibly do. Okay, uh, what does SA 240 talk about? It talks about the auditor's responsibility to consider fraud and error. So the standard deals with both fraud and error. It's not merely fraud alone. To identify and assess the risk of material misstatement in the financial statements due to fraud. To obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence regarding the assessed risks of material misstatements. He has mentioned about all this, so I will not go through all this. Through designing and implementing appropriate responses. To respond appropriately to identified and suspected frauds. This is the objective of the standard. We have uh, we have two kinds of things. One is fraud. One is the other one is error. In uh, misstatements can happen because of two reasons. It could be because of manipulation of documents, misrepresentation of facts, fictitious according to general entries, or it could be misappropriation of assets. So you have two types of fraud. One is the financial impropriety, which is the second category, misappropriation of assets of the company. The first one is the fraud in reporting. Today both these issues are, are, are somewhere interlinked because the moment there is fraudulent reporting, the government automatically jumps that the promoter has siphoned off money and has slacked it in outside the country. Okay, um, This is the um, natural uh, observation saying that you have just not manipulated a few numbers but you have done this with a certain purpose of trying to siphon off the money. The moment, and tomorrow we have also a situation where even for medium sized companies, if your client, God forbid, gets pulled before the uh, NCLT on account of insolvency proceedings. Okay, even at this stage, uh, and many of these, I mean, today uh, the focus seems to be more on large borrowers, but in course of time, the focus will shift even to small borrowers. Maybe in a couple of years, the focus will shift even to them, and we'll have even smaller companies going before the um, uh, NCLT where they have borrowed money and they have defaulted. And the moment it goes before the NCLT, obviously there are going to be questions saying, "What have you done?" Okay. In fact, I recently had a, I, I know of a case where in a, small, in a very small company where uh, uh, the, the, the company did not repay the bank loans but they gave the money to a related party. So the auditor was called to the NCLT to explain what had he done about this. The, the, the insolvency professional petitioned the NCLT to say that the auditor should be called and asked to explain saying that why did the company not uh, pay money to a related party, why did they pay to, why did they not pay the bank. Why did they pay to a related party? And honestly, this chap rang me up. He was in a panic mode. He rang me up to say, what do I do? Tomorrow is the hearing. He called me up on a Sunday morning. And said, tomorrow is the date of hearing. I have to go. The NCLT has called me. Small company. I don't think that uh, probably the turnover is next to nothing at this stage. Maybe at one point of time, they had some transactions. But now, the turnover being already before the insolvency court, the transaction is nothing. So the CEO was put, I was standing before the NCLT in Bangalore and Raheja. 
and asked to explain why the uh, company chose to um, uh, pay money to a related party rather than repaying a bank. The, the, the insolvency professional petitions. So this could happen even for small entities. This not, need not happen only to uh, huge companies where uh, only the um, uh, big listed companies where there's public interest, NAFRA, forget about all these big issues. I mean, it may not concern many of us. But we might have an NCLT case or today even the tax department is going on an overdrive. Uh, the moment there is some kind of a um, disclosure by the, promo, by the owners during the course of search proceedings and if it exceeds a certain limit, I, I here understand that automatically notices are being sent to the tax auditor and to the, and to the statute auditor. So the problems uh, small practitioners like all of us face is may, may not be NAFRA, but then we have problems that we might be called before the, by the NCLT. Tomorrow the banks might say that yes, you did some fraudulent reporting. Or three, you might have a situation where the income tax officer or, or even probably the GST or the, the GST authorities try to tomorrow say put you over the coal and saying that something is wrong and you have colluded with that. I understand, I mean, I'm, I mean I can't mention names obviously in this kind of a thing but I understand that uh, in, a, in a recent search proceeding the company gave certain disclosures saying that yes this, this much of concealment has been there and the auditor they have sent a prosecution notice to the auditor, it's a small company. Probably not even a company. It's a partnership firm. It appears there is some circular of CPTD saying that if there is more than some 25% change to the returned income during the course of a search, call the auditors also. So the threats for our, I mean, we should not assume that small, we, are, we are only doing small companies or we are doing only medium sized companies, and to us, we don't have all the threats uh, which. Uh, which probably large companies have, or listed companies have. Our threat can come from the NCLT, our threat can come from the income tax department, it can come from the banks, it can come from the GST department. Today you commonly hear saying that GST there was a fraud due to some manipulation of input to it. And if it happens to be a financial statement which you have signed, you have a problem. Okay, those charged with governments, they have to consider the management's responsibilities is obviously the management, uh, the primary responsibility for prevention and detection of fraud. Uh, those charged with governance should consider the potential <coughs> overhead of controls. Sundaration is dealt with management's overhead of controls in significant amount of detail. For other inappropriate influence or financial reporting, he needs to do that. Uh, coming to the responsibilities of auditors, you have to obtain reasonable assurance that the FS taken as a whole. <coughs> Okay, uh, they are free from material misstatements. Let me do one thing. I will uh, deal with the auditing standards per se. Let us have this open discussion. Uh, so let us try to see how we can, uh, uh, what we can, what is it that we can practically all do, particularly in a, in a medium-sized company. What is it that we can really do? <coughs> Apart from, I mean, of course, you do a you do a risk assessment, you do an audit strategy, you design, you decide the timing, nature, and uh, nature of your, I mean, the, the timing of your procedures. I mean, whatever Sundaration spoke about, all the planning exercise which is required, you do that because the standards are not making a distinction between a large company and a medium-sized company. They are um, they are talking about it, uh, talking about the same thing uh, uh, for everybody. Okay. I don't know whether we are ever going to have our standards and auditing separately for medium sized companies. So whatever Sundaresh spoke to the extent that we can adapt it um, to a small and medium sized company, we have to continue to do, please let us, uh, let us escape from that. Okay. But then afterwards coming on when you start doing tests of control, when you start doing uh, substantive procedures, I would think the first, in any, I mean I think we should at least ensure that all areas, all significant areas are taken up for a detailed review at least once and two to three years max. All areas should be taken up. Um, um, uh, at least so that once in two to three years you, you, you ensure that you cover all areas. Maybe you, uh, you may not have the ability to cover all areas in one year's audit, but particularly where you, you can, not in a bank audit, in a bank audit you are there just for one year, next year you have nothing to, nothing, you may not even be able to go there again. 
So you will probably have to cover more areas as far as the bank audit is concerned, bank branch audit is concerned. But there is a regular company audit. Okay, you, you could perhaps uh, cover all areas over a period of two to three years and cover the most critical areas to start with, and then go into the other areas also. I think the first step would be to uh, ensure that you have a download of the entire universe of those transactions. Okay, and then while uh, Sundaresh might have access to specialized audit tools to to uh, analyze and uh, analyze this data, I think uh, we could all uh, depend on even Excel tools to under to to dissect and bisect this data and do some amount of data analytics in this data to understand what the um, uh, what this data is all about. Let us look at some simple things that we can do. Uh, let us look at just a, a procurement to pay cycle. At least I think it's important first of all to understand what are the uh, what is the volume of transactions through various types of suppliers even before you start the audit. Who are your principal suppliers? Who are your A, A, A category materials? Who are, your, who, are, who are your suppliers? B category? Who are your suppliers? C category? Who are your suppliers? And you have some idea about the total quantum of these transactions with them. You could use simple Excel tools for this purpose. Okay. Uh, or again, if you have, if you've got, if you're doing an audit to um, audit to pay, I mean audit to um, um, uh, O to C cycle. Again, you could at least buy, for, I mean, uh, I mean, download your say, your sales universe, and then trying to um, uh, to analyze the data to see what is what are the various transactions with various kinds of people. I just want to give you a practical example which happened. In a previous year, we knew that there was a certain scrap dealer to a company. We used the company to sell scrap to him. The next year, suddenly this chap started supplying copper to the company. So possibility is that yes, he could have become a dealer for some copper. Obviously, he did not have a copper company. I mean, a copper smelter or copper refinery he did not have. But he could have been a, he, he might have become a dealer for some other copper company. This is possible, but never does the, 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 this little clue uh, set us uh, going. And later it was found that these bills were accommodation in nature. But the, but the real clues, I mean, otherwise those uh, those transactions had everything with them. You, know? you had uh, you had purchase orders, you had goods received notes, you had invoices, you had um, uh, at that time let's say a send back number or you had a GA a back number, you had every damn thing. But only one of my staff just asked one question, say this chap was a small scrap dealer, where is he now coming and selling you copper? That's all. Is this, and then one thing led to the other, one thing led to the other, and then it was realized that all these purchases were bogus. But the only single clue at the initial stage was, I've seen this chap's name last year. He spoke about continuity of an audit audit efficiency because the same staff are being continued for some reasonable amount of time. You can't continue them for too long, then they become too familiar. But this chap just asked this question. He also spoke about normal transactions. In one more company we had a case where some purchases had been booked through journal entries. The, or the article club who went there just said, why are the booking purchases through journal entries? Why is this not coming through your purchase module? That's all, simple. Only one question. And again, when you go to the, then everything is there. GR is there, invoice is there, purchase order is there, every crap is there. But this girl, it was a lady who did this. She went to the gate to see whether these materials had been received. And as luck had it for her, there were no entries in the gate for the materials having been received. Then she went to the stores to say, okay. You bought these materials, what did you do with it? She found that there was immediate issue of these materials. It has been purchased today, the same day all materials have been issued. So no trace at all about it, for which, for which, what order did you, tell, did you use these materials for? The company had no answer. But the two simple clues were two. In the first case, this was a scrap dealer last year, some small scrap dealer to whom, with whom you would sell some steel scrap. And today how does he become a supplier of copper to you? And you're buying reasonable quantity, 20 metric tons, 30 metric tons this year, or two. Um, we have a situation where purchases have uh, been booked through journal entries and not through the normal purchase route. <coughs> Perhaps when you analyze this uh, this universal data, you could look for these kind of examples of where purchases have been booked through journal entries, sales have been booked through journal entries. If 
For example, let's say you take, I, I don't know really what has happened, but if you let us say you take the case of Satya. I, heard, I hear that yes, the sales are being authored, put through by the CFO. Okay. Normally you would not expect the CFO to sit and book, uh, book, uh, book entries relating to sales. And normally the, the, the sales clerk or somebody, the sales accountant or somebody would be doing it. So if you see that in your ERP dump or your purchase dump or your sales dump, if you see that some transactions are being done by somebody who is not even connected to this transaction or who, or who ought not to be doing this transaction, why is the CFO of such a large, I mean it is a, Satya was an NYSC listed company. I'm not sure if it's NYSC or NASDAQ. Huh? NASDAQ, huh? Okay, it doesn't matter. From our perspective, it does not matter. Why is the CFO of this company putting sales invoices under his, under his authorization? If you see the invoice, you don't find anything wrong with it. So what I'm trying to tell you is that if you analyze or if you get in the universe of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of whatever population that you want to test, and then use your common sense. <coughs> I immediately tell you common sense is not common. But nevertheless, with whatever karika we have to make do with whatever limited intelligence all of us have. Uh, we try, try to understand and see what, what these questions are. First of all, uh, segment the um, um, population through, let's say, party-wise. Look at transactions which have happened, let's say, every 15 days what's happened to see if there are any sudden spikes, sudden troughs. To see if transactions have been put through on Sundays. Transactions have been put through outside of office hours. Pro. I'm assuming that the ERP has got a, a dump of at least at what time this transaction is done, who authorized this transaction, who approved, who input this transaction. I'm assuming that this data is there. So you uh, you sort on all this data to find out any kinds of abnormalities in the data. I think, uh, for example, the big four might have great analytical tools or tools to do all this, but I think we could use even simple Excel tools, or I think even Rafik has got a small audit tool which through which you could analyze this kind of data to find out all kinds of abnormality in this data, whatever form and shape it takes. Uh, here in a, in, a, in a large jewelry company, where the price of gold has changed at 11 o'clock in the morning, because the price of gold is known, and in a, in a, in a gold car, in a jewelry company would know that every day the selling prices change based upon the gold price. The entire inventory has to be restated, their selling prices to get restated every day at, at multiple points of time. Because you're not going to, just because you bought it at some old rate, you're not going to sell it at the old rate, you're going to sell it at the latest price of the rate. And what happens is, is this gold rate gets communicated, let's say at 11 o'clock in the morning by your head office. Very large company. And obviously it takes another 15-20 minutes to give effect to this in the ERP system. So this chap knows that today the price of gold has dropped or has increased. And he would take advantages and make transactions during the first 10-15 minutes. If there's a drop in price, he would, um, uh, he would ensure that yes, he, he buys but he was during that time for himself. Or two, if he, see, if he sees the prices of, I mean, he knows the prices drop, drop, but the customer is not aware of it. He would, uh, uh, he would charge the customer uh, some other some price and then and record a lower price. <coughs> I, I hear that something of this kind has happened. So what, what, what I'm driving at ultimately is that you try to look at your universe, try to dissect this data, analyze this data, and see what kind of uh, data analytics you can do with this data to find out what are the abnormalities in this data. Where is the concentration of data, or concentration of transactions, or concentration of transactions who have been put through by the system, put through in the system? What has been done outside office hours? What has been done um, uh, on holidays? Has somebody made entries in the stores records on on, on Sundays? Yeah, occasionally there may be a case where somebody has come on Sunday and caught up with some backlog. And, and in two, again in medium sized companies, we need to have an idea of what are the kind of volume of cash transactions which have taken place. Because a lot of transactions, particularly in some kind of retail business could have happened in, in, uh, in by cash. I know of an e-commerce company where obviously all collections are in cash. Okay, and there could be some by credit cards. But number of customers pay, number of customers pay you by cash. So this promoter thought that he was being very smart. He said, I'll save GST or the VAT, why should I pay VAT? So he went to the show, went and went and then he used to buy in cash. Because he thought he would save money. Uh, actually, he did not siphon off any money from what I know. But he thought he would save money, why pay 18% GST? 
let me buy things in cash, I don't want invoice. So buy in cash. His sales are all paka because they are all recorded through the internet, it's an e-commerce company. I don't think he has tampered with his, with his uh, e-commerce, with his uh, computer systems where his sales get uh, booked by the customer and he pays it there, nothing has been uh, tampered with that. Tomorrow he has got 20-25 crores of sales. But then when it comes to purchases, he has, he has used all these transactions to buy in cash so that tomorrow he thinks he saved GST and uh, he saved 18% cost. Because he's also giving discounts to his customers below the MRP being an e-commerce company. And he's in such a huge jam because of this. Today this company is being taken over by somebody else. And they want him to give indemnities for this. And uh, a simple thing like uh, 483, I must feel, I'm estimating it to be over 15 crores per annum. The possible disallowance on the 483. And two, you know, and the second is that there are two companies where money flows from one company to another company and we have this new provision 269 ST or something of that kind where you have uh, cash receipts about 2 lakhs. I'm not very sure that I'm quoting the subsection correctly but 269 ST or something of that kind where the volume of transactions is about 2 lakhs. So I think it's important to identify all cash transactions particularly in, in, in owner driven businesses or where in any business where you think there is greater propensity to, to spend money in cash and stuff like that for whatever reason it might be. So please analyze this data first of all and try to understand all kinds of variations whatever you can think of. So that tomorrow in your audit procedures this will, this will form the basis for your risk assessment which he's been talking to you about. If tomorrow you've got large cash transactions. And uh, this company finally happened to be obviously there was a venture capitalist involved in it. And the venture capitalist obviously said one of the big boys should do the audit. And uh, finally, he has had an audit report where they have disclaimed opinion on the entire on the entire financial statements because everything is made in cash. We don't have sufficient appropriate audit evidence. And what a jam he has got himself into. Okay, so coming back, so please analyze this universe trying to dissect and bisect this in any manner that you think appropriate. I can, we cannot lay, lay down any standardized rules. Obviously, you may not have access to sophisticated audit tools to, uh, or even some of these audit tools might be available uh, without too much of cost. I think it's important to analyze and break up this uh, information, dissect this information or identify what are your problem areas before you start your audit. Two, I think uh, all key areas we must go through a fairly rigorous IFC, test, IFC type testing uh, which is laid down in the, in the institute's guidance not used in this COSO framework and uh, in a procurement, in a, let's say in a procure to pay cycle it is not we are merely checking some invoices being accounted there are various sub activities within the procure to pay cycle for example identification of vendors empanelment of vendors in your vendor in, 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 your, in your company placing of purchase orders, modification of purchase orders Goods in words. Each one of these are sub processes within, within this overall activity of P2P. I think it's or making advance payments to vendors. I think it is important to identify each type of activity, each sub activity within this overall activity of, let's say, uh, overall business cycle of P2P. And at least put through 10, 15, 20, 25 transactions there. That's the ideal recommended number, but at least put through 25 tests, 25 types of transactions, uh, 25 transactions. For, for the various controls that you expect that, that will be there. Whether documented or not, okay, you know that the company tells you based upon your walkthrough saying that these are the procedures that we need, I mean, these are the controls that we have. You at least ensure that yes, all these approvals, the MD's approval is there. We generally take it for granted in a private company. As uh, his approvals being there for all these transactions at various points of time, particularly prices paid to suppliers. And is there again segregation of duties? Somebody unconnected to the transactions for why is the CFO putting our, uh, I mean accounting sales transactions or even in a bank for example these LC opening, opening of guarantees or opening of deposits, opening of NRE deposits, opening of FCNR deposits. Each of these are separate activities, they, they might look like it's a, it's a deposit, what do I do, I just check the, open, uh, the, uh, the composition, the closing balance, make sure interest provision is made, maybe I'll make sure that some TDS is done and that's the end of the matter. Carry out a few analytical procedures and that's the end of the matter. I think what is important is that to ensure that yes, acceptance of deposits, repayment of deposits, premature repayment of deposits, change of nominations, 
death claims. Each of these are separate sub processes within the activity of overall acceptance and deposits and repayment of them. For example, you, uh, today I've had, a, we've had recently a case of a fraud in a company where in an electronic banking transaction, so they should also be keen to hear this. Uh, in an electronic banking transaction, when, uh, when I put through the bank's portal, he's been changing the bank account number of the vendor. Obviously, in a private company, this number is not seriously controlled. It's there some, it's some silly Excel sheet. So he puts the name of the vendor properly in the HSBC portal. He's put the name of the vendor properly. The amount is a valid, a valid bill. I mean, some bill amount is there. He's a regular supplier. So if you look at it, it looks like he's a regular supplier. He's gone and quietly changed the bank account from the vendor's bank account to his own bank account number. Okay, so the, the, the signatory who has authorized these transactions, he has not noticed this. He says, I went by the name of the vendor. And apparently, the HSBC portal had a provision whereby you could, you could create a vendor master inside the vendor in the, in, the, in the payment portal. And then you could draw their data from that. But for whatever reason, this company did not know about it, whatever, whatever it is, it did not happen. So every time he would go and change the bank account number, wherever he felt it should be appropriate, he would go and change the number. The money would go to his bank account or to some bank account of whomever he, he nominates. He is identified. But in the books it is looking as if it's a, an RTGS payment or a, a, a NEFT transaction to a, to a vendor. To, again, small medium sized company, only MD signs checks. There is a big danger in this. MD is constantly travelling. All MDs like to travel all over the world, whether they have business there or not, no business there. What do they do? At this time they sign some blank checks. They rather, it's much better for them to entrust this responsibility signing checks to somebody, but nevertheless they don't believe it to be right. They will only sign, they will retain all signing capability with them. But then their pension for traveling is undiminished. Today everybody wants to go to the, catch the next flight and travel to some exotic place. So he would sign blank checks and leave it with some, the finance manager. This chap has got hold of uh, the check, the, the finance manager intern has given these checks to this guy. And he has in turn, the manual checks he has filled up, some other name, a dummy supplier, and he has used these checks. And wherever there were fund transfers, he has changed the bank account number, the name of the vendor, he has kept it intact. He has changed the name of the vendor to his name. So, what I am trying to tell you is that you cannot just barely go by an overall process saying a procure to pay cycle, just look at some overall things and be done with it. You have to break this activity into small sub processes and trying to ensure that every sub process, it could be making payment. We all assume that anyway payment is made by account paycheck, I have nothing to worry. At best, there will be few one stray confirmations here and there. I think we need to ensure that. Every sub process is checked. 10 transactions, 20 transactions. Yeah, and as Sundaresh mentioned, again, the GST portal is going to give us uh, excellent, uh, is going to be an excellent source of information, in, in, uh, particularly to ensure completeness and accuracy of purchases and sales, perhaps. Sales, I'm not sure how to do it, but I think definitely purchases. Completeness of purchases, whether with or whether, 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 without confirmation of balance, whether payments are being made to them, you can't find out. But at least I'm sure if you cross verify your purchase, your subject as your AP ledger, the credits in your AP ledger with your uh, <coughs> vendor's uh, statements, I think GST are 3B, uh, what is that? Whatever that, uh, whatever that form is. If you do verify, even uh, verify, let us say, even for one month, two months, let us say March, February, Completeness of transactions, recognizing that yes, no purchases are getting omitted, expenses are not suppressed, profits are not inflated. You would have a next. I mean, the GST and portfolio has got an excellent, is an excellent medium for us to ensure that yes, there is reasonable certainty of purchase. I mean, purchase and sales. Perhaps sales also can be done in some manner to find out what is the purchases booked by your car, by booked by your customers. <coughs> So I think it is important that first of all we analyze this universe and then two, we get down to um, uh, doing a thorough process audit, end-to-end -end audit of at least chosen processes, 
I will spread this over a period, even a period of two to three years, ensure that all these processes are checked and whatever is expected to be done is done. And if tomorrow you feel that there is no segregation of duties, at least put this down, report this to management. And of course, this has to get uh, supplemented by other procedures, it has to get supplemented by analytical procedures, by confirmation of balances. For example, again, you take this, uh, what happened in Brady Street. If tomorrow Indian auditors have this, uh, this habit of calling for confirmation of balances from the foreign party in whose favor LCs are open. Okay, somewhere we don't have this confirmation of balance culture in this country. Nobody responds to confirmations. Even the banks don't give you a proper confirmation of balance. In fact, all transactions with the party are not put together in the bank in one place. They give you piecemeal information. I think the first job RBI has to do is to tell banks bloody damn well provide confirmation. I mean, confirmation of all transactions to a, to a to a customer in one place, and respond to auditors if they ask you if they ask you for a confirmation of balance. I think where it is not only. You have a different confirmation for loan, you have a different confirmation for SB balance, different confirmation for current account balance. Tomorrow if there are some, let's say there are some derivative transactions in the bank, you are not even aware of it then. So it's important that somewhere the RBI passes on a message to the bank saying that you must give, um, we have device questionnaires whereby we ask the company to, to capture all its transactions with the, with the bank and ask them but invariably they don't respond to that. And probably we don't have the wherewithal to go to the bank, follow up with them, sit on their head, get that in the format in which we want. <coughs> but I think this business of getting confirmations, uh, for example, whether there are foreign counterparties, because foreign customers are probably more uh, receptive to requests for confirmations. So, for example, in Brady Street, if perhaps the auditor had asked, uh, some branches, it need not be uh, Antwerp's branch where many of these frauds probably took place, let us at least he had, he had shot a few where uh, what are the LCs which are outstanding as in 31st of March by uh, LCs open by Punjab National Bank. Or tomorrow we have, we have your customers dealing in securities, they have investments in mutual funds, they have investments in securities, uh, demand statements might be forged, uh, you might have uh, NSDL statements which are not true. So it is, it is good either you call for confirmation of balances on these tra types of transactions and I think uh, um, it's important that at least we, we, we beg an effort wherever possible to show that we have really done all these things. The other situation is yes, we must compulsory be present for stock take. And uh, after the stock take is over, it is important again to identify excess and shortages between our books and our physical inventory. And also analyze. Uh, what is the actual consumption versus the theoretical norm, based upon norms? I remember one company which uh, which I used to do an audit uh, way back in 79 or 80 when I was a fresh chartered accountant. This company used to produce mixers. No, I mean domestic mixers like uh, Sumit, uh, whatever current brands are, I don't know. But anyway, let us say you produce mixers of Johnson mixers, these mixers and stuff. And in those days, we had to submit all these quantitative particulars in the financial statements. So we had uh, we had consumption of jars, we had consumption of motors, consumption of blades. My staff came up to me and said that the consumption is more than the production. They're having. I thought you know it's a very straightforward industry. You know, one mixer has got one jar, and at that time, nobody had multiple jars. Or you had one motor. That's it. They didn't have, there was no situation where one mixer would have five motors, some mixer would have four motors, no such uh, jazz. Suddenly came up and said, why is the consumption of uh, uh, jars more than the production? Why is the consumption of motors? Motors consumption is 10,000 jars, mixers produced is only 8,000. And uh, Later, when this was confronted to the managing director, he said, yes, these wrong made and said, cash states are made. Obviously, I need money to live in this world. You can't live in India without money, without uh, cash. I was given a big lecture. And let us say you blindly put this quantitative data either in, your, either in the financial statements or now in your tax audit report. 
where you don't review this data, but you simply put uh, put all this data there, and it is shown that the consumption is more than the production. At least you should have a knowledge. I mean, you should be aware of this so that at least you can, even if you want to fiddle around some data. But I'm not suggesting that, please. But definitely, you need to correlate the consumption of materials with the production. And in many companies, except very complex processes are involved. You can establish a reasonable correlation, even if you take a, an automobile manufacturing company like Maruti. Every car has got only five tires. Not that Maruti is doing any of these, no, I'm not suggesting that at all. You know the consumption of tires, what it should be. Maybe paints is more difficult to find out. But you know, as far as tires are concerned, that there can only be five tires. For an Ashok Leyland, there can only be, let's say, back, uh, back, chair, back engine, back, uh, back, uh, back wheel, there are some for, four, front there are two. And then there's one step knee, two step knees, whatever it is. It could be that there's some pilferage even down the line. It's not even that they are diverting and selling tractors in by cash. I'm not suggesting that. So, what, whichever area that you pick up, I think what is important is that you do a thorough audit of these processes. Two, we must get into more into the habit of calling for confirmation analysis. And I hope uh, not only the government also has to work with us to ensure that yes, there is some compulsion for companies to produce confirmation balances. This GSTR, uh, the GST network is one great opportunity by within India whereby at least you can get transactions for overall domestic transactions. But I think for all cross-border transactions, even in the bank, I think you must, we must ask for confirmations that uh, uh, from the foreign party for, uh, for LC is open, bank guarantee is open. Let's say a securities company where you have got investments in mutual funds, you buy and sell securities. We must get confirmations positively for all this. And whenever you're doing particularly bank audits, please put this down in your report if they don't do it. If they don't give it to you, please put this down in your non formal report. Let the statute auditors worry about what has to be done regarding it. But I think you know, since many of you will be going into bank audit shortly, I think it's important that every major process, though generally in a bank we all look at the current position of assets and liabilities more in detail rather than worrying about transactions during the year. I think it's now the time has come that yes, the fraud's happening every other day. Uh, and uh, this will have to apply even to uh, transactions happening on the internet, NEFT transactions, RTGS transactions. And some minimum audit of the, uh, the ITGC, the IT General Controls, that Sundaresh was talking about. I think it is important that these things, the core banking solution talked about the bank. I think it is important to at least understand what validations it does. I uh, hear that in even nationalized banks, uh, the IT head is asked to give, to correct some data and then give it to the auditors. Because most of these reports are downloaded to Excel. Most dangerous situation when, uh, appear when you get reports in Excel. Because people can correct this data. And we all love Excel. As a community, we love Excel. If you ask me, it's one of our biggest, biggest enemies. It's fine if you're doing project reports. Or you want to do some kite flying, some impairment testing, calculation, all that is fine. I've heard that even in a, in a large nationalized bank, the IS head is called and asked to tamper with some data as far as the NPS are concerned. It's not that every case of divergence, somebody has been negligent. So I think whenever you, get, you accept Excel as a, uh, some Excel report or like he said, uh, whenever somebody gives you a computer report and it could be from Excel or it could be from wherever it is, all of us tend to accept this blindly. Everything that he has told you is pregnant with meaning. It's just that we need to catch on to that and see what has to be done. So when we have data which has come from, from let's say, from some computer system, we generally take it for granted. I think the first thing is to ensure that you do some validation checks to ensure that what they are giving you is a true actor, extract of what is there in the database. It is, not, it is not necessary that you should be able to run these programs independently, but you could even access, uh, run through the database to see that whether some of these figures are all, first of all, obviously things like whether times is a GL, you would definitely make sure. 
and then or you want to test some particular type or some particular column let us say who put through these transactions then if you have some doubts on that then you have to make sure that whatever data that is there in that excel report <coughs> nobody has <coughs> interfered with that data I think some of these things are done, we will give ourselves some chance to end here, of course, cut off procedures and now uh, for people who have got in there, there are other issues. Anyway, I am assuming that most medium companies will not have the headache of uh, uh, in there because the net worth probably will not cross 250 crores. Unless there are some associates or subsidiaries of some listed company, they would not have this headache of uh, in there and stuff like that. So, please. Uh, since this fraud reporting is our biggest irritant with the government and apparently the government has even told the institute saying that if you guys can't uh, detect frauds because I think the institute has tried to represent the government saying that look here uh, an auditor can't be expected to find frauds and they said why are you there? We will abolish audits and all of you can go home and sit and find because ours is completely a regulatory, uh, regular compliance driven profession we are all there because of the law Tomorrow they just, just say that yes, all private companies, no audit is required. I think it's uh, so there in America, right? No audit, audit is not compulsory. So tomorrow if a company of India just says, okay, you guys can't find frauds, you can't find errors, we agree. Let's uh, say no longer audit is compulsory. Yeah, US only listed companies, publicly interested entities only, they have audit. So we, let's say, and I we all love what the US is doing. Whatever Trump does, we love. Whatever the US does, we love. We think that that is the gospel truth. So government tomorrow says, yes, we'll abolish. Though the current tendency is to put more and more work on us. So I think it is, and since this is the biggest irritant in our relationship with the government, or even with the uh, regulatory authorities, I think it's important. Sundaresh, if this would you have any, any views, please. Yeah, it's very important uh, the way we are there, uh, the perceptions are uh, is running the profession and uh, what he said on the audit. In fact, within half, uh, we were looking at it, what we, uh, we were testing ourselves what is the work which you are doing in audit. If audit is not mandatory, how many of our clients will ask us to do an audit? That's the kind of uh, thing which you are working on. Are you delivering value to the client? Uh, the client will voluntarily come and do an audit because even if the audit is not mandatory. Okay, that's the kind of thing which you are looking at. Uh, there is nothing which is there because a lot of complexity is involved. For instance, I was, he was talking about uh, fraud being an MPA banks. As I told you, automated controls are reliable. Even the automated controls can play around with it. Just an example of one which we have done. For instance, after 90 days, no payment has been done. It has to be an MPA. So it's a very simple thing, okay? You can actually put through a payment on the uh, 87th day, 89th day, it will not throw as an MPA. So you what do you want to reverse the transaction afterwards? No, no, no. I'll just tell you a classic example. We have a process in my audit, which I did, I have my team as a process. They will put through any transaction cash payment which is made from say not 90th day, say 18th day to 90th day, whatever is a payment made in that account. So we want to know. No payment made till 8th year. You won't believe. On 90th day, there was a payment made at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, withdrawn at <laughs> 10 o'clock in the night. Then we said, look, there's a fraud. How can you withdraw something at 10 o'clock in the night? So it was a bogus thing which has been put through, kind of a thing, which is the, the knowledge of the branch, kind of a thing. So we took it. Luckily, we had to extend the thing. We, like what I told you, we asked for all the data of such payments and test the report generated from the system is correct. So we can uh, show that the program is not being tampered with. There is a program to generate MPA for no payments within 90 days, but you can easily tamper with that program by making payments. Or actual payment also, you can make the payment and withdraw. So it will not throw up. <laughs> okay. So there are a lot of things. We, these are all not uh, done as sort of, uh, this is a simple thing that uh, even the management was aware. I took it the audit committee board. Everybody was uh, was not 
not very surprised in the sense. So we were we to worry. We were able to detail, test and find out any such thing in reverse. We treated with an NTA. I want to put it there. Once you go with them, that kind of a thing there was. But it was not unusual. It was not unusual. The manager was not castigated or anything. He was reprimanded for doing it at the last minute. Or without telling the management kind of a thing. Okay, so... You've only been reprimanded for not doing it properly. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows that uh, he is he's, he's supposed to do, even the MD knows about it. But he's only, he's only done what you have done at Shodi. No, not tell you the audit committee was surprised, then how did you find out? So they are they not out they were interested. So we had to tell them, look, uh, audit is not, we use our intelligence. So we can tell that this is a standard process that we follow to ensure that the reporting is correct. Because as I told you, ITE, what we call it is information produced by the APT. We need to test it whether it is uh, robust. So you put through these kind of transactions, these kind of things. So you need to think through each one uh, differently and find out kind of uh, thing. There are things which are done. You will not be able to find out. He was talking about bogus transaction. I was uh, I was not doing the audit. My colleague was doing it. I was doing quality. A steel company which has become sick. They were doing trading in steel. Okay. Like what I was telling GST, they were paying sales tax, they were uh, collecting, input credit, everything is properly done. But uh, when we go there, we cannot check it. Okay, steel never comes into the premises, not go. It's a trading, uh, purchase and sale. We landed up in qualifying. First year I qualified, second year, first year disclaimed, second year I said negative report. We resigned. He said, we don't know, we cannot verify it because all the documentation is there, but we believe it was something bogus. <laughs> they told us some story saying that this is true with some uh, thing we need to generate. There could be bogus uh, uh, discounting of bills on a temporary basis. But these kind of things, anything which is abnormal, what they said is to be looked at. Frauds come in if something goes out of the way. Satyam sort of thing is totally different in the same way. Actually, apparently created a new business. And then sales were booked in the new business and all those kind of things. It was a very, very what do you call... Uh, schemed fraud kind of a thing. But lots of frauds are not schemed that way. This is one or two here and there they will do it just for fudging the figure for one period. Next year period will get reversed. These kind of things uh, will be there. For instance, uh, something like a, uh, the NPA, according to me, is not a fraud at all. It is just a sort of, uh, I am to bank out. It is an interpretation of reserve bank regulations. Like uh, they send me a note. I have put in my report 120 crores incurred loss not being booked by the bank because of RBI guidelines saying that don't book it, it's spreading over one year. So that's the kind of thing I have actually put in. As an auditor, I said 120 crores is sitting in your asset. There is no asset. It's a loss. Yeah, the VRS compensation, I think in some year they said you can spread that over a period of time. No, I think VRS is deferred revenue, you can call it. This is something if there is a fraud. Suppose if there is an account where it is a fraud detected on the account, you provide 100%, but that 100% can be apportioned over a period of four years. And they wanted to sell sick, the, if you are, uh, they wanted to encourage the bank to sell uh, sick assets to the uh, uh, separate entities, banks are not doing it. So they said, okay, you book the loss, but spread it over eight quarters. So the loss is incurred, I have sold the assets, I have incurred the loss, but the loss is not accounted over a period of eight years, eight quarters. This is the RBI rule. RBA regulation. Now what do I tell? RBA regulation is accounting. I can't say it's not true and fair. So we have to put a EOM paragraph saying that this is not done. So the reader can understand the balance sheet has got 100 crore which is lost sitting there. Okay. Now what do you tell? Reserve Bank have allowed it. They are not because they have their own need to do it because they wanted to encourage the people to sell the sick assets. They were not doing it. So they gave the waiver. Okay. So there are challenges. This NPA. This NPA, if there is a simple rule that anything beyond 90 days you provide and then nothing can be done. Is that bank for the past 15 years there is something called restructuring. There is a restructuring. That was the reason for all these NPAs not being provided. You do a restructuring, restructuring will not work. When the restructuring doesn't work, then you have to take it back to that original period and provide. Most of this uh, divergence which you are talking about is related to that. The RBI has got its complex rules. They will allow the banks to do it. Okay? So that was, the, if it was a simple rule, there was no need to do any divergence. It would be simple. Okay? But they went and they did things like restructuring, the 
strategic restructuring, all kinds of things, it all failed. Okay, now it has got the HCLT, all those things. Now, so when the broad bank is touching the MSC company, you know. <laughs> so MSC, government itself is actually pleading in respect of power company. I have a power company. The bank has given a confirmation it is a standard loan. Okay, the company has defaulted for two years. The bank people are on the board. Two of the people, directors are on the board. Now the bank has confirmed it is a standard loan. Now they say don't put any going concern mode. I said, look, the bank, it is all going to answer because you have defaulted. I, def I said nothing doing. The yes. bank may say that bank has not given a report. What you are touching, we are not hearing. We are sitting outside. They okay, sorry, no. sorry. No. Whether you are addressing only few persons sitting here or you are not addressing no, other persons. No, I you don't. have to take a microphone and talk to them. Yeah, sir, no. sorry. We no, 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 no. So, your point is not it. No, 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 otherwise, no. you should go there and you should talk. Okay, sorry, sir. So, Not only negligent, you become a party to the whole fraud. 
That is a danger which is now coming. Every thing, they are not saying you are negligent. They are saying you have done the fraud, you are party to the fraud, and it's a criminal offense. It's not a failure of fraud, it's your negligent in not picking it up. They are saying that you are party to the fraud. So that way, it is very dangerous. There is happened in such It's not a negligence. Auditors are in jail, are in jail, and all people they are saying you part of the fraud. You did this. Okay. So the way it is, even if gross negligent, they say you were purposely negligent so that the company can do the fraud. That's a line of argument CBI and others are doing. Okay. So we need to be careful with respect of fraud. Kind of. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Udresh. Uh, I hope all of you take management representations. It's extremely, it's an important, extremely important audit evidence that you have management representations, uh, including in your branch bank audits. Uh, it is possible that your branch manager will tell you, I will not give you a representation. Uh, and finally, let us say you end up not getting it. I think it's important that you report this to the statutory audit. Uh, it is important to be done. It is very important that all of you do, do take representations from your clients. This is an extremely, I mean, um, extremely imperative piece of uh, documentation that you need in your files. And there are standard formats given for this, and you have to adapt this, add more things, there, whatever you want, and, uh, depending upon the progress of the audit, but it's extremely important uh, written representations. <coughs> Please don't take this uh, lying down saying, okay, I can get this signed whenever I want. My, uh, the managing director is my friend, he will do it. It is important that these representations are taken. I think we all need to get into this habit of saying we won't sign without it. Yeah, even for my mother, I will not sign without getting my management representation. And we have a situation where from 1st of, first of February, we will start um, putting everything without getting a number from the institute, no? UDI number or some number. We have to get this number uh, henceforth before we sign any, any, any report. So along with that, I think this uh, MR is something that we have uh, uh, definitely that we should uh, yeah and then uh, communication with those chartered governments of course if it's the uh, MD, it's a completely owner driven company owner owned owner, owner driven company they might be you might just informally discuss with them but at least I think it will be a good idea for, for you to come back and document all these things make minutes of your meeting with this MD to show that you have discussed all these things and incorporate as many of these things in, as possible into your management representation to show that yes, you have uh, that you have some evidence to show that these issues were discussed. <coughs> yeah, all this yes, uh, yes, uh, we have uh, we have discussed this uh, audit evidence in appropriate amount, in a fair amount of detail. This audit evidence has to be gathered for all these uh, uh, tests, walkthroughs, analytical controls that you do. It, you, you need some evidence to show that these things have happened. I think it's very important to get hold of all key agreements with our, in our, our files. All key agreements, all minimumly, min at a very minimum, all the processes that need to get followed. All these things get documented, even if it's not there in writing as a company. We at least know, we document ourselves for, in simple terms, in simple bullet form, what the processes are and what are the documents that we have, which are the transactions that we have tested. Anything key, I think it's important to do this. We may not be able to keep a, keep a full trail of, of, of every transaction right from the beginning to the very end. Uh, we might not be able to do that in a, in a, in a, in a medium sized company, but it is important to identify what are the key controls, all bank confirmation letters, confirmations for securities held, uh, all, key, all key agreements, minutes of the board uh, tomorrow, when let's say particularly where uh, minutes are, are commonly changed in these private companies. You, they, they, you, you see some minutes when you finalize the audit, tomorrow these minutes always many times can get changed. And tomorrow by the way when you go before the NCLT or something of that kind, you have a completely different set of minutes which you are confronted with. I think it's important that we keep copies of all signed minutes in our files. Because in, particularly in private companies and unlisted companies, it's very easy to change the board minutes. 
probably more little more difficult you know, in a large company, but you know, in a small company, these threats are real that we know all these things can get uh, changed. And many of us are also certifying this. Uh, I, I mean, maybe your company secretary is certifying this uh, uh, MGT7 or whatever it is. So I think it is important to keep all these uh, signed copies of all these minutes in our records. Whatever you feel which you cannot lay your hands later on if something goes wrong, I think it's important that at least in these cases we do keep at least copies of our critical agreements, <coughs> copies of the minutes of meetings with the MD, board minutes, general body meeting, AGM minutes, I think all these things are important, we have to insist that these are, even if you have to draft these minutes yourself, you have to get them drafted, get them signed and keep it with you. And I think we should get into the habit of at least making two simple sets of documents, an audit planning memorandum and an audit closing memorandum. You know, I mean, um, uh, even if you don't have too many things in, in between, at least I think it's important to have an audit planning memorandum where you um, do uh, write something about this risk assessment, how have you chosen your samples, what is the change in the business as compared to the previous year, what are the regulatory issues concerning the business, what are the material limits that you have fixed. I think some of these things are very minimal need to get documented in your planning memorandum and then you have a closing memorandum to say that yes, uh, all procedures that we have decided as per the audit planning memorandum are being carried out, uh, the material limit has changed, not changed uh, and many companies they delay pre preparing the bank reconciliation statement saying we have no staff, very very dangerous situation. Just yesterday, I, I was talking to a client and they were saying that we have not prepared our BRs from April. Um, somebody left. We are, we are still worried about chasing, the, the company is still worried about chasing numbers of, 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 of revenue, of business, of profits. They keep chasing that. But then nobody worries about this BR is not being prepared from April. I've told my staff saying that this is very critical, please check, uh, I mean after they prepare the BRs, please make sure that they are not done in some uh, haphazard manner, uh, and entries are force, uh, force matched, because we commonly come across situations where BRs is not done, done continuously for six months together. They know that you will never check all the six months uh, line by line. <coughs> Even if you have the habit of checking one month reconciliation, you will not do it the moment it is done for the whole year, uh, as one block or one, 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 once in six months. It becomes very dicey, particularly in these VRs. And uh, in, uh, in, in some of these companies also, I mentioned to you where he has, uh, he has drawn cash, but uh, the, the, I mean, but, but, but they have issued bearer checks. The, the bank has also recorded the name of the party, they have not written that it's a cash with the drawing. They have issued a bearer check to somebody. The bank statement also shows as if a check was issued to this party, uh, surprisingly they have not said it's a, it's a cash drawn. Because in many of our medium sized companies, uh, uh, people, the MD or the minor people in management draw the cash out. Even simple, I have mean, even, even seen simple things like bonus of all resigned employees, cash is withdrawn. And in your 43B, we'll be happily saying that these are all paid. Yeah, this using the work of another auditor. All of us commonly use the work of another auditor or another expert in the audit of our uh, things. Today you have got property valuation reports. Either because you want to revalue your assets or you have to do some fair value assessment. You have actual valuation reports given by actually, particularly in entities where there are large number of employees and gratuity and uh, uh, retirement benefits are a significant element of cost. Any change in these numbers, in these estimates that are used can significantly alter the liability. For example, in, in, let's say in a bank, if you are doing the head office audit of a bank, any change in the actual assumptions can change the, uh, the, uh, the gratuity liability and the leave and cash flow liability or the pension liability significantly, even by changing by 
any company which is uh, employee intensive, it could be even an IT company, IT services company where uh, there are a lot of staff. Banks, honestly it's a nightmare to verify those assumptions which they have done and which they have given to the actuary. And their, their pension schemes and all are quite complex, you need to understand how the pension scheme operates. And ensure that the data used by the actuary, uh, even if today uh, probably uh, Sundre will have a tool to verify, to cross verify what the actuary has done. But you and I may not have the ability to cross verify what the actuary has done and how he has used the projected credit method and, uh, and done the calculations. But at least definitely you need to ensure that your inputs given for the actual variation, tying it up with let's say the March payroll, making sure that all your directors and all who are probably even paid separately and not paid through the normal payroll, that they are all included for the purpose of the gratuity calculation if they are eligible for gratuity. Because MD will invariably be the highest paid employee in the company and if he is left out because his, pay, his payroll is not prepared by the regular person, it's prepared by somebody else and that is left out, your liability is going to, I mean your actual money is going to go for a toss. And some of the assumptions that he has used about attrition, about, uh, about the, rent, the number of increments that are being granted, the retirement age, the leave rules of the company. It is important that at least you validate all these assumptions which the actuary has used. You cannot use the an actuary report, just put a, a, a final tick to the final computer, liability that is computed and not given in the books, particularly where these, uh, this, uh, this liability is, uh, these liabilities are large. Because invariably all of us depend upon an actuary's report for calculation of gratuity and uh, compensated absence and pension. Similarly, we might have cases where there is a, an, I mean, uh, there could be a valuer who is valuing a property. <coughs> and so you are revaluing your, uh, uh, let's say, land and buildings and bringing them to the balance sheet. Or you are doing some fair value assessment and stuff like that. It is very important to go into these, into these areas. Probably other kinds of uh, specialist reports <coughs> may or may not be applicable for many other <coughs> Again, I think it's important to discuss with the internal auditors and to find out what comments they have. Uh, quite commonly, the internal auditors ask to give two reports. One report which can be shown to the statutory auditors and one report which is only for the master's eyes only. So I think it's important that you should ask the internal auditor to at least send you, uh, send you to, uh, directly through his email ID at least all the reports that he has given. If he still does not give you some reports, okay, tough luck. But I think it's quite common in many companies where there's a separate report given on some matters which is not for the eyes of the statute auditors. <coughs> One has to be careful about uh, careful about any such reports which are not given where you, are, you don't have access to. Because in large companies, you do depend upon the internal audit work to quite an extent to do as far as substantive and to substitute substantive to take testing. Uh, today, large companies you have a lot of uh, whistleblower complaints, special audits done because of this. I think uh, it is important that we ask them uh, whether there have been any forensic audits done, any special audits done based upon whistleblower complaints, review all the whistleblower complaints and see what is the action that is being taken against them. And I think, uh, though it's not going to be easy, I think we all have to do some minimum forensic audit in many of our audits in days to come. One might have to ensure that yes, we at least we have general understanding of forensic audits because today frauds are becoming the order of the day. Uh, I don't know. I don't even know that whether every kind of fraud can be found out through some kind of forensic study. But then, uh, let's say through computer forensics, uh, it's important that uh, at least we understand basic concepts of forensic audit and see wherever it is required. And in some cases, ask the management to get this done if you have a doubt. Maybe you don't have the expertise, or you're not expected to do a forensic audit either. But I think it is important that if frauds come to, uh, we have suspicion to believe that there are frauds. I think uh, it is important that uh, uh, for 
this account is done. For example, this company which I told you where the bank account numbers have been and names have been changed. In fact, there the statutory auditors are saying that there should be a forensic audit done. Given all the statutory auditors, they said that a forensic audit should be done. Otherwise, we are withholding our report. Small company, nothing very big. Some 40, 50 crores turned over. And then the company came to us and said, please do a forensic audit. And we came up with a number of something like 1 crore rupees of irregular payments in the span of 6 months from the time this guy joined. He joined only in December 2017 and he was sacked in July and August 2018. And in this 6-7 six, six, months he had already siphoned off 1 crore rupees. In a company whose property whose profits are one and a half crores, two crores. Some four percent, five percent of their turnover. This is a typical margin most people do today.
Your statute auditors, whom are you? Do you know who your statute auditor is? In every bank branch audit. I think the first thing is to refer is to talk to him. If there's undue pressure on you to complete, they don't give you representations. They don't give you whatever data that you want. I think the first important thing is to bring this to the notice of your statute auditor. Because, okay, uh, making the government change, making the RBI direct banks to appoint auditors early, is, uh, may or may not happen immediately, or even it happens in one year, it may not happen again the next year. I think the first step is to bring the, to discuss with your statute auditor. And if you feel he's taking matter cash in, I think you should at least cuss it a couple of mails to him. The bank, of course, will try to put pressure on you until you even not reappoint you next year. Please don't get uh, too cowed down by all this. It's not within the branch manager's control to appoint you, not to appoint you. So don't get carried away too much by this. Because if somebody tells you, as a small practitioner, you won't be, you won't appoint you next year if you ask too many questions, it is certainly it doesn't make you feel nice. But I guess we all have to stand up. And collectively all of us have to stand up, it's not one person standing up alone. But I think the first step of uh, your first point of call should be your statute. <coughs> Please don't hesitate to uh, call him, talk to him. And today with uh, anybody's number can be found out. Not going to be too difficult. And send mails to him. Please put down in writing. If you put down in writing, he'll also take your job more seriously rather than telling you something in the phone. And worst come, please put this down in your uh, in your audit report or your LFER. But your point is valid, madam. Uh, uh, I think the the RBI, the government itself has to take this matter seriously of putting undue pressure, particularly in our nationalized banks. There is uh, the managing director is going to retire, so he wants to finish 20th of April. We have all these kind of undue, uh, unreasonable exchanges pressures. We all understand that yes, as a listed entity, they have to finish before uh, before May. End. This is known, and if they have to finish before May, end, if you work backwards, you have to finish your branch audits by let's say 15th or 20th of April. That's perfectly, that's reasonably legitimate. But then putting undue pressure, you saying finish by third, finish by fourth. Nothing you can, you can do by third or fourth. Because on first, second, they'll tell you this is bank closing, we have to still prepare these things. The number of holidays land up in April. Ugadi comes in April, some of, them, some of the Good Friday comes in April, something else comes in April. But I think as a profession, today the time has come when we need to stand up and say, this is what I can do. Take it or leave it. And if all of us do, it won't be easy for them to say, okay, I'll change you. So the trouble comes only when one of us do it and others don't do it. Yeah, any other suggestions, questions? But I think all of us need to apply our minds collectively to this Mama uh, job. In course of time, Mafra will get extended to smaller firms also. Or otherwise they might form one more Mafra Chota companies. The institute will only conduct examinations and do CPE at the end of the day. It's a university. It's a university. Huh? It's a university. I mean, probably the day will come when that's going to happen. And they will, uh, and I don't know now, I think we have to, uh, we have not do a dual jurisdiction, one by NAFRA, one by the institute. Because I don't think the CA Act has been amended. So I think we are both asking clear questions. Huh? Yeah, yeah, we have NCLT, we have the SAC, we have the we have the Reserve Bank, we have everybody. Directly we'll have it. So the Reserve Bank is issued a circular, then they will take action. Yeah. In banks, I mean in bank audits they will take they will take action. So the whole I mean today we are only catching the policeman for not doing his duty, the criminal is is little bit. To us the, the, the motto seems to be punish the policeman. Criminal can go away. Then after all, say, yeah, it's normal. It's human, human nature. But the policeman should be immune to the system. He should do extraordinary things. But the criminal, after all, not a politician, a criminal. Yeah, yes, please.
Shalom. Whenever you want to close it, go close early. Shut and shut. One thirty. My question with the respect to the valuation of the shares in case of startups. See, generally these days, uh, even though that valuation uh, has come from the institute, many does not follow that because then when the management has given the estimates of the projected balance sheet based on which we have done the share valuation and foreign investment has come into our books. But as a statutory auditor, can we take the stand given by the other professional colleague that whatever valuation he has given is correct? Or if we find there are some mistakes, how to report that? Or how to overcome that uh, concerns? <coughs> if you are not issuing that report, is somebody, else, somebody else was giving the report. As a statutory auditor, where, where, where are your concerns? Let us see, where does it affect your financial statements? One, I'm assuming that the transaction is genuine. Money has come, it's not money, it's not a money laundering case, it's not uh, affected under some Binami, uh, Binami Prohibition Act. I'm assuming that the transaction is legitimate, there's been a, uh, an angel investor, a domestic angel investor who invested money into your company because that section is, uh, is not applicable for uh, non-residents. So it's a domestic angel who has invested in your company. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe that this will affect your financial statements in any way except the provision for tax. Okay. Is this uh, income tax departments have so many reports on the uh, engine? But, but I think the, the problem will be very is, is uh, today I don't want to issue any valuation report when if I have uh, for, a, for an angel investment in a company under the Income Tax Act. Under Section 56, I'm very frightened to issue any report. Because there's no way you can verify the projections. So our projections are cooked up. No company is going to, I mean, no company's discounted cash flows are going to substantiate their valuations. I don't think there's going to be one single e commerce company whose um, the present value, the future cash flows is going to substantiate their, the share premium that has been given to the company, not even one. Whether it's Flipkart, whether it's Amazon, whether it's Cloudtail, whichever company it is, I don't think there'll be a single company whose uh, um, uh, the projections are going to be tampered to give you those figures. I mean, you take, you take a company like uh, this, uh, I mean, uh, online, all these online apps which you've got, they're valued at billions of dollars. How can their cash flows, uh, the present value of their cash flows be one, one billion dollars or something of that kind? Swiggy. Okay, just let me talk of some case where uh, since I ordered some food recently on Swiggy, you know. I mean, how can their cash flows, uh, um, uh, how can, if you have to give a report, how can their cash flows, uh, the present value of their cash flows be uh, justify a violation of a billion dollars? I mean, luckily most of the time this money comes from non-residents, so you are probably out of the tentacles of that section. But the moment if it's a domestic investor, I or an angel, there is no way you can substantiate this. I think if you have to issue a report, you have to merely say, I don't know if, whether the valuation standards say that this is only a calculation engagement. It's not a valuation engagement. Where I'm only checking the calculations and doing reasonable things based upon the figures that you've given me. Of course, the moment you say that, the tax authorities will not accept that report. But as a statute auditor, I don't see what uh, risk we are in except barring the tax provision. And more, more often than not, these companies have got sufficient loss. Even with the additional share premium, possibly there will be no income except that there could be penalty proceedings in 271 c I don't know in what other manner the financial statements will get affected. If there's some, something which I'm missing, please tell me. Uh, I'm assuming that you are just the statute order and you have not given this report. Uh, I think, uh, possibly we don't, I mean, uh, it, it does not affect the financial statements in too much of a manner. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. I had a suggestion to you know, handle this. There is a circular from CBD to the accounting bank, to the assisting officers, regarding how the valuation to be done with the startup company. Startup company is defined there, that's the other one. When a startup company is defined as, you know, so for the date of evaluation, for six years. So, valuation as bestowed on the student is not applicable for this company. <laughs> So, we are lenient, so lenient uh, in accepting the valuation. 
other than the graduation method prompted by our institute. Is there really any linear even I think the situation for diversity based method? Anyway, this is not a topic which really I should be addressing. If tomorrow we have a, we have a valuation session and stuff like that, since I am now receiving we are now receiving as such standards and auditing, um, I think let us look at what effects of financial statements. Because, uh, My general take is that as long as you are not suspecting this to be a benign investment um, uh, or, uh, or some uh, so it's a recirculation of black money uh, into the into the company, the share premium is uh, is the, there's been an estimate share I mean share transaction based upon this. Uh, based upon a certain premium, uh, I, I don't think as statutory auditors we need to worry too much about this valuation. Yes, it might affect your tax expense. Uh, and if most of these startup companies, if there's law, they're going to have a loss even after adding the share premium account. Possibly the uh, it's further diminished, except that possibly there could be a 271 c penalty. But this is really draconian. Because somebody in the government, some DMK party did this, they start uh, bringing, you know, bringing changes to legislation. Uh, in Bangalore, yes, a lot of people could, be, could suffer because of this. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know a lot of, uh, lot of, uh, lot of people have got notices. And uh, where they have uh, taxed the share premium account, uh, they have taxed primarily because they are the, the actuals are not uh, not uh, not in line with the projections taken for the purpose of evaluation. Because while doing the DCF, they have gone by a certain amount of projections. Because at 56, uh, 56, 2, 7 or whatever it is, it gives you, a, I hope I am quoting the subsection rightly, it says that you can follow a DCF method. And if you follow the DCF method, what happens is that you are uh, on a base of projection ca cash flow. You are trying to find the present value and trying to see the share premium is justified. Obviously, to tick the box, they need a valuation report from a CEO or a merchant banker. But tomorrow, when the assessment gets takes place, it takes place two, three years down the line. The actuals are far, far, far shorter than, uh, are a fraction of the projections made. So he says, all the projections are fudged. You haven't done sufficient diligence on the projections. I think we have to be very careful before we accept any uh, valuation. What precautions we should take? I think we should reserve this. Shravan should get one more. Uh, um, somebody else to come and talk about this or maybe even I can talk but I think that's a different session but that's really a challenge in Bangalore where I think probably there are how many startups are there uh, Sundaresh, thousand startups? A thousand startups and which, uh, which are getting valuations uh, at all kinds of numbers. I mean I can't imagine how some startup company can be valued at one billion US dollars not one billion lousy rupees. Great companies don't get valued at one billion. It's a brick and mortar. But if at the moment it's an, it's an internet-enabled company, its valuation goes through the roof, eyeballs, footfalls. And we don't. I mean, any of, none of these methods are really uh, because the income tax act says it should only go by DC. If I don't even take even market multiples or other companies and say, yeah, Amazon got. I mean, Flipkart got uh, got valued at 20 billion. Though they have uh, make some multiples and apply that in this case, I don't think valuation methodology given in 56 to 10 permits you to do this. Yes, please. Any other question before I hand over the mic back to Shard? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I've enjoyed being with all of you and uh, to share a few thoughts with all of you. Uh, I'd be happy if even any of you can even call us later and tell us your thoughts of how we could uh, bridge this expectation gap, uh, make our audits more meaningful. Collectively, as a profession, I think we need to uh, we need to change. Uh, no one person can do that, but collectively, I think all of us need to change, and uh, that's the only way uh, we can continue to be relevant going forward. Because all our practices, fortunately or unfortunately, are uh, Compliance drill. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sham, for giving a lot of uh, practical insights to stress about the importance of uh, having proper audit evidence, having proper audit documentation. In fact, the session has been a eye opener of a sort. We need to practice what we preach when ICI issues the standards on auditing. It is, the onus is on us as the professionals to actually put them into practice 
so that quality of the deliverables is uh, maintained. On that note, uh, I would like to thank uh, Sham for having taken his uh, time. Can I uh, request uh, Sangeeta Dandraj to kindly come forward and present a uh, memento to the session speaker, Sham Ramadhyay.